Oh, it is some. Um... Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Sabka baut baut swagat hai. Uh, we really thank uh, the uh, Maharashtra NNF to allow us to start this program. Uh, this is a basically a uh, kind of a teamwork which we do every day in NICU. Hum aur nurses hamesha saath mein team mein kaam karte hain, but we always say ki nurses want to learn more, they want to do more, and this is a kind of a humble attempt to actually help all of you to reach the knowledge gap. So, aaj ka jo pehla topic hai, wo niyon jo sepsis hai, main hamesha bolti hu sabko. कि बेबीज आर द मोस्ट एडवांस सॉफ्टवेयर इन द वर्ल्ड क्योंकि सब जेनेटिकली प्रोग्राम है अपने आप बड़े होते हैं पौधे को हमें खाद देना होता है लेकिन वो अपने आप ही बड़े होते हैं वैसे बेबीज आर जेनेटिकली प्रोग्राम टू ग्रो What we have to do in the NICU is to prevent the acquired problems. Huh? That is अगर बच्चों को बेबीज को इन्फेक्शन नहीं होता है तो लेप्टेस नहीं होते हैं एंटीबायोटिक्स नहीं लगते हैं ब्लड प्रोडक्ट नहीं लगते अपने आप बिल कम हो जाता है so when we want to say we want to give a good quality nursing care to the babies at a very very reasonable price or very low cost first thing we all have to do is to prevent the neonatal infection so with that not i thank again the whole maharashtra ob to start this series and uh, request dr shilpa kalane to share her precious experience with all of us good afternoon everyone Uh, thank you state nnf chapter for giving me this opportunity am i audible am i audible uh dr shilpa my apology you are very audible i really have to first thank uh, our two experts of the experts uh, the first expert is dr rahul yadav is a teacher of the teacher a very senior practicing neurologist for, from maharashtra and now practicing uh, in uh, chennai i always keep uh, you know looking for his advice time to time and i remember in 2019 when we had a outbreak of the infection in the nicu and i was so uh, frustrated i had actually went all the way to nasik just to meet and you know take his guidance and the another very very experienced uh, uh, person the president of uh, maharashtra uh, ob this year dr rishikesh thakre from aurangabad Uh, sir is a patient teacher and we will be very happy to both of uh, to have both of them as an expert and keep giving us the expert inputs throughout the talks over to you dr shilpa thank you so much and uh, yeah good good afternoon everyone so i'll be talking about nursing management of neonatal sepsis so uh, i think prevention is being uh, is going to be covered by uh, dr hari so uh, and uh, here we are going to talk predominantly one sir i think yeah so th this is going to be the outline outline of my talk so i'm going to talk about what is neonatal sepsis uh, the clinical manifestations and uh, management so wo dikhne mein dikh raha hai bahut sare aise you know neonatal sepsis clinical manifestations and management but don't worry don't get scared i'm not going to be theoretically discussing these topics so we're going to share our experiences okay so it's uh, if possible we will make it interactive but uh, uh, so uh, if you have any queries please uh, put them in uh, the chat box and also if i ask certain questions please answer them in the chat box so uh, going further so yeah so neonatal infection as you can see here this is the pie chart okay so you can see here there are different shades of colors the blue is the maximum number that's 28.5% and this uh, correlates with the prematurity so this this pie chart tells you the causes of neonatal deaths in india and the uh, first most cause is prematurity and if you look at first three causes of uh, neonatal mortality infection is one of the leading cause of neonatal mortality in india so it is that ram it is like an ele elephant in the room you look around and there, there is an infection so what is it what is neonatal infection what is neonate neonate is a baby who is less than 28 days old and what is neonatal sepsis neonatal sepsis is a bacterial infection in the blood you call it early onset sepsis when the baby develops infection within 3 days of life you call it late onset sepsis when the infection when the baby gets infection 
after three days of life right why is it imp why is it important because the clinical manifestation change based on the time of onset as well as the causative organism that is gram positive gram negative these also change based on the uh, the uh, onset of the infection so a baby who ha who is uh, early onset sepsis that is the if the baby gets infection within 72 hours the predominant presentation clinical presentation is going to be more of respiratory right if the baby is uh, gets an infection after 72 hours then the predominant clinical manifestations are going to be systemic and more towards neurological <coughs> so what are we going to talk in this uh, uh, what uh, we are going to cover in this talk is uh, what a nurse how the nurse is going to co uh, uh, contribute uh, for the management when it comes to neonatal sepsis so i feel i cannot uh, imagine management of neonatal sepsis without a nurse it starts right there from early recognition okay then we're going to see monitoring management supporting parents and prevention i'm not going to talk in detail but a few aspects so um, so the baby is whenever they're born if there are any issues the baby is go to nicu and the maximum time who spends with the baby is nurse okay so even if the parents are there the doctors are there but the maximum time who spends with the baby is a nurse and she knows the baby better because time to time everything she is noticing so i think she is the person if given uh, if you empower them about the clinical uh, early uh, clinical manifestations of sepsis then the early recognition of uh, infection would be done by them primarily uh, and it would be easy then to manage and to prevent the further complication of the baby so what are the going to be the uh, so what are the clinical manifestations just go through uh, we'll go through them briefly uh, so you label a organ system and the baby is going to manifest with that system for example they are going to be neurological manifestations they are going to be uh, respiratory manifestations gi manifestations hematological manifestations the clinical manifestation there could be a subtle symptoms which would be picked up by nurses when you manage during your day to day rounds or there could be obvious clinical manifestations like bleeding severe respiratory distress or convulsions like that so we'll go through the predominant common manifestations the first more is uh, first is temperature instability what is normal temperature of a baby so the normal temperature is axillary temperature is 36.5 degree centigrade to 37.5 degree centigrade a baby is said to have fever if the temperature is more than 37.5 degree centigrade and the baby is said to have hypothermia if the temperature is less than 36.5 degree centigrade and there there are grades of hypothermia you have cold stress mild hypothermia moderate hypothermia and severe hypothermia now why is it important because the baby with sepsis may manifest with fever or hypothermia fever is an ominous sign when if a baby has a fever and if you rule out environmental cause of fever then you are likely dealing with the temp, uh, the uh, underlying sepsis and whenever you notice this when you manage on you uh, round the baby you, uh, you need to note it down and bring it to notice to the doctor okay so fever or hypothermia could be a manifestation of underlying sepsis what is this so this is a baby okay and he's uh, look at his uh, the baby's breathing pattern the baby is having substernal retractions baby is also having intercostal retractions right so this is called respiratory distress the respiratory manifestations of infection are going to be either respiratory distress like this it is uh, mild to moderate but it could be severe degree it could be just tachypnea and if the baby is premature it could be apnea what is apnea apnea is cessation of breathing okay and uh, if it uh, uh, may or may not be associated with bradycardia or desaturation then the babies may manifest with cardiovascular instability it could be in the form of tachycardia or bradycardia or the skin manifestations like mottling or off colored or maybe pale colored skin the crt uh, capillary refill time of more than 4 seconds is also a, a manifestation of cardiovascular instability so when you are rounding you know that you know the, the, you've come in the morning you rounded the baby you know that the heart rate was 140 150 and now for some reason the heart rate is increased to 180 
or you have not received over that the baby is being tachycardic but now you are seeing that the baby is tachycardic or there is lot of variability in heart rate. The heart rate is fluctuating from 130 to 180. I am just giving an example. So, there is a lot of fluctuations in heart rate. So, the fluctuation in heart rate or persistent tachycardia could also be an early sign of sepsis. So, beware before even clinically manifesting the babies may show subtle signs of sepsis in the form of change in vital parameters. If you have a blood pressure monitoring with you, invasive blood pressure monitoring or non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, a fall in blood pressure could also be picked up and that also could have could uh, be uh, brought to notice. What is this? Anyone can unmute and answer. What is this? So, these are you can see that the baby is awake, but there are rhythmic movements of the upper limbs and lower limbs. So, these are convulsions. So, a baby could also present with uh, convulsions. So, around 30 percent babies with convulsions could have meningitis and around 70 percent of the patients with sepsis can have uh, uh, convulsions. So, poor feeding also is a neurological manifestation of the sepsis and that a nurse who is managing that baby would know, okay, this baby was feeding uh, well yesterday and now something is wrong, something is going wrong. The baby is not feeding well. The baby looks little loose. Yesterday baby was doing well, but now it's not looking good. The baby is being irritable. I'm not able to console the baby. Okay, so these are the subtle findings you would notice that okay, this baby is not doing well. Something is wrong with the baby. The moment you have these findings, then you need to note note them down and you need to tell the doctors. Then there are other symptoms also that uh, like jaundice, hepatomegaly, poor feeding, vomiting, abdominal distension, diarrhea. These can also uh, be the presenting signs of sepsis. So, you need to monitor these babies and uh, as soon as you know that there is you know every abnormality in vitals or every abnormality in even uh, abnormal sign may not be sepsis always. You have to monitor that baby continuously and if the signs persist or if you do not find any other correctable cause for those symptoms or this, those signs, then you have to definitely think about something is going wrong and that needs to be alerted as early as possible and I think that that is done predominantly by nurse and in our unit uh, we, we tell them when we round, when we know that okay this is a premature baby, 1, 2, 3, 4 risk factors are there, then we uh, write certain things, they, okay sister this baby's heart rate should not go beyond this, this baby should have heart rate between this, it should not drop below 120 or uh, the saturation should not drop below 90, the blood pressure should not drop below, uh, mean blood pressure should be uh, above 13, should not drop below 30, the sugar should be maintained in this range. So, we give them a checklist 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, these things should be maintained, the temperature should be like this and any problem in this please uh, tell us. So, this is how you can you know have the policy in your unit. There are subtle findings before even the, so there should not be a word called crash in your unit. If you have, if you monitor these subtle things, then I think we can, we will be able to pick up these babies fast. So, uh, going towards management, when the nurse manage the such such a baby who is uh, septic, so it uh, the management includes you know the procedures as well as the clinical management, and uh, the the important part of the procedure is blood culture. So, can uh, anyone unmute and tell me how the blood culture is taken? Hello, anyone, any nurse can unmute and uh, okay. So, anyway, so this is what needs to be done. So, you have a sterile site preparation, okay. What is important here, either you, you can collect the blood culture in one bottle or you can have two bottle culture technique, any, whatever is your unit policy. What you need to remember is that the site of collection should be sterile and the minimum volume what you collect, collect is around 1 ml for the baby. Okay, so if you have a center line in place and if you are collecting blood through the center line, if it is recently placed center line, you can collect the blood culture through that center line. However, there could be a possibility if something grows in that line, then it could be a colonization, not the uh, true uh, infection. So, in that case, you have to have paired sample from the peripheral vein as well. Okay, so you have to have two culture bottles if you are collecting sample through the center line. Otherwise, you uh, you can uh, continue with one sam uh, one bottle technique, and uh, which you prick uh, 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 the fresh sample and you send it. So uh, the main management is so when you have this such patient, so uh, you have to focus on maintaining this thermoneutral zone. What is thermoneutral zone? It's an ambient temperature which you maintain where the baby's basic metabolic needs are met 
at the uh, and the oxygen consumption is also on a lower side uh, this typical temperature is between 36.5 to 37.5 degree centigrade if you have this temperature uh, the baby's temperature is 36.5 to 37.5 degree centigrade but the ambient temperature if you exceed that if it is on lower side or if it is on a higher side then the baby is going to spend energy uh, and uh, is going to be vitally unstable so you have to maintain the thermoneutral zone um, also maintain oxygenation and ventilation the oxygen uh, the target saturation limit for the premature baby should always be 90 to 95 percent and the uh, FIO2 should always be titrated accordingly. Maintain fluid and electrolyte balance as uh, it has been ordered. You have to be very careful in having input and output charting because these babies have a lot of uh, uh, fluid electrolyte imbalance. They may have edema, they may have dehydration. So, accordingly, the, uh, the input output charting becomes very important and uh, accordingly, accordingly, the fluid needs to be adjusted. Maintain perfusion, you have to um, uh, monitor heart rate and blood pressure in such patients and if there are any um, uh, fluctuations in heart rate and blood pressure accordingly, the uh, management should be done. And this is very important, I think Dr. Hari will be covering this. You should have a checklist for prevention of ventilator associated pneumonia and central line associated bloodstream infection. Am I going too fast? Is it okay? Hello? It's going very well, Dr. Shilpa. Everything okay. makes sense. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. So the this is what basic clinical management needs to be done. Now, this each and every uh, uh, point uh, is very important. These are the key messages because you have to maintain the uh, baby's overall uh, homeostasis well so that the baby recovers fast. And one do, should not forget the developmental supportive care. It is apart from the clinical management. The holistic approach is you have to uh, have this key. Uh, you have to remember this five core uh, components of developmental supportive care whenever you are taking care of such patients important this pain protection where you assess the pain uh, wherever you perform certain procedure and you manage that accordingly so you can manage the pain by non pharmacolo pharmacological measures that is swaddling or you can have a pacifier or non nutritive sucking or you can put two three drops of mother's milk uh, orally and that is how you can uh, minimize the pain Clustered care is very important, bundled approach is very important. So, you do not, you protect the baby's sleep, you do not disturb the sleep. Whatever interventions you are going to do, you club those interventions. Nesting should be done, swaddling should be done and the uh, you take care of the environment, uh, predominantly sound and uh, light. Kangaroo mother care also protects the sleep, so you protect the sleep. Uh, developmental supportive activity of daily living, uh, de uh, daily li uh, livings that includes feeding, nappy change, etc. Also, do not forget family centered care. You involve parents in the baby care. You educate them. You tell them about the baby's condition and uh, you, uh, empower them. You uh, make uh, take them into the confidence and uh, uh, mainly you support the mother, which I will be talking uh, in, uh, about this in next two slides and uh, healing environment. So, noise level uh, in NICU should not be 45 uh, more than 45 decibel. Okay. So, if you have very high noise, you know, tapping uh, of your hand on incubator is going to create a loud noise that, you know, 80 and 90 decibels and that is going to cause a lot of uh, uh, autonomic instability as well as it can also lead to intraventricular hemorrhage. So, you should, you should be very careful uh, about, no, uh, about the sound level in an ICU and it should be strictly maintained below 45 decibel. Light, uh, there are certain limits. So, when you are doing procedure, be sure that the procedure light uh, does not, uh, you know, the baby is not exposed directly to the light and you need to cover the baby's eyes. The allowable limit of uh, 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 light during procedure, procedure is around 200 to 400 foot candles and uh, otherwise you can have day and night cycling of light. Uh, position, baby should be po uh, positioned in flex posture. Baby kaise hota in utero, Ekdam, uh, upper hands flexed, lower limbs flexed. So, basically you have to give that posture to the baby so that uh, the uh, that provides a healing environment to the baby. Okay. And kangaroo mother care is the key component whenever you manage this way. If the baby is stable, hemodynamically stable, then KMC for sure. Do not forget mother. So, you have to assess uh, uh, mother's perception and knowledge about breastfeeding and extent of instructions that has been given. Now, uh, give emotional support to mother and accept decision regarding cessation or continuation of breastfeeding. 
because these mother are go- mothers are going to be in different completely different state of mind and any anxiety any pain any stress in these mothers is going to cause suppression of lactation so you have to promote lactation you have to uh, give them confidence you have to emotionally support them you have to keep on educating them about ma- uh, the milk expression importance of milk for the uh, baby's growth and uh, f- the further improvement uh, re- encourage her to obtain adequate rest maintain flu- uh, the nutrition as well as uh, sh- regular breast pumping is also advised that is every 2 to 3 hourly parent and infant uh, attachment is going to be a big problem whenever a baby is septic so uh, i don't know this is our experience uh, that you know parents whenever the babies are sick we do lot of counseling to relatives however somehow parents are pretty close to the nurses whenever it comes to the baby management and uh, even if we say okay the baby is fine baby is uh, you know doing well or the baby is little sick ultimately you know they'll go back and ask nurses how is the baby today how is the baby today they'll keep on calling the nurses so i think somewhere that that link is very important you are the best link and uh, you have to uh, so you have to remember this and you have to talk to the parents uh, give them confidence and involve them in uh, uh, the activities ask them to touch the baby talk to the baby think good about the baby also give positive feedback for nurturing and protective uh, parenting behaviors very important antibacterial stewardship is uh, very important that you, you should have a antibiotic policy in an icu you now this patients and we manage so we start with uh, the baby is very sick we start with the higher level of antibiotics however stepping down of antibiotic is very important also stopping the antibiotic is very important in our unit we have empowered nurses for some reason if some concerted uh, continues antibiotic beyond certain duration even if the culture is sterile the nurse reminds the consultant sir should we stop the antibiotics so it's very important okay so somewhere that check needs to be there and i think nurse is a, is a very important the plays important role in keeping that check now this is uh, the uh, prevention is very important when we talk about nursing management i'm sure dr hari is going to cover but hand hygiene is extremely extremely important whenever we talk about the ne- uh, neonatal infection without hand hygiene it cannot be discussed now hand hygiene should be so robust so robust that even if there is an infection all around the bug should not reach the baby okay it should be like a security guard sitting there in the um, uh, uh, sit- sitting at the airport right so it keeps on checking you so that you know that nothing will be passed by so it should be that stringent and uh, we should change our mindset so any premature baby or any baby in an icu rather than saying that the infection is inevitable in that baby we have to start thinking that it is preventable and it can be done only by using this path of quality of improve quality improvement and also one should have audit of the all the bundles which are used in nicu for prevention of infection thank you so in fact neonatal infection management as well as its prevention when we talk about it the uh, team is very important and the uh, nurse plays an important team uh, role of team member so thank you so much hello yeah thank you dr shilpa that was really very very nice talk lot of revisions all the practical tips uh we will request uh, rishi sir and rahul sir to give the expert comments Rishi sir is there Rahul sir Dr Ashish any any comments from you uh yes uh i think that was an excellent talk um especially briefing uh, everything about the neonatal sepsis part and uh, are there any questions uh, which can be uh, i mean uh, if, if anybody wants to any nurse wants to know ki a uh, sepsis related any questions there is a question in the chat box what should be the first line of the antibiotic the first line of antibiotics depend upon your unit policy it is not that you know okay, i have certain okay, policy okay i'll just 
yeah so i have certain policy in the same uh, the same antibody you need to use in your unit so the basically uh, your microbiological data your microbiologist and your neurology must be knowing and based on the sensitivity pattern the antibody policy is decided so you have first line antibody second line and third line antibiotic uh, generally it is a single antibody so in our unit we use amikacin as first line antibiotic but basically how we decide is uh, you know uh, you just look at the culture of last one year what yeah. is the most common bacteria you are getting and which is the most common uh, antibiotic which works against that antibiotic it is different for every unit every city every microbiology lab that's why it has to be decided by your flora with your microbiologist and you revise every year any other question actually uh, you know i sincerely request uh, you know because we dr hari has a lot to cover and his talk is fantastic so i really suggest you all of you should actually put the questions in the chat box so that experts can keep answering them and we can actually at the end allow the you know experts to give the key comments because it is very difficult to cover such a big topic in one hour time so we take one more uh, question from galaxy s8 plus and then we'll request dr hari to start his talk uh, galaxy s8 plus please uh, 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 madam that is no, no, uh, that's mine only <laughs> <laughs> okay all right i think so no problem thank you so much dr shilpa it was fantastic very useful now over to dr hari please teach us what can we do so that we prevent you know our babies getting the infection Dr. Hari is a practicing dermatologist in Mumbai, and he has delivered uh, talks multiple times uh, in Mumbai uh, in front all of, for all of us, you know, in the past. And I'm sure he's going to do a fantastic job. I sincerely request everyone to be very attentive to his talk. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. uh dr hari you are able to not share able the screen to no no i'm not able to share that's why i sent the ppt to um, uh, actually dr jaisal also on the uh, mail okay. i'm not able to share acha uh, so dr jaisal uh, do you have the ppt i i i can am i uh, am i able to share the ppt yes yes you will be able to share it okay No, Doctor Hari, I have not received your PPT. No, it I sent the... it to Jaisal. Jaisal, Doctor Gmail. No, no, it is a a chat. Sent it to Jaisal. Yeah, I got your PPT. Hari. Yeah. I'll just... Yeah. thank you thank you dr thank you jason ma'am yeah uh, so uh, i thank maharashtra uh, nnf for organizing this uh, 
a talk for uh, nurses so uh, my topic uh, can you go to the previous one previous slide please yeah my topic uh, is supposed to be a, a an extension of the previous talk where you know the theoretical aspects of sepsis were covered so this is going to be a more of a practical talk uh, unfortunately you know I, i have only made the presentation on nicu environment disinfection however the role of a nurse in infection control has so many domains it starts right from hand washing supervising procedures in the nicu aseptic non touch techniques supervising insertions of lines ventilator bundles and also looking into specific hygiene and cleanliness of specific areas in the nicu where uh, uh, infection practices need to be very very much implemented such as laminar flow room and the milk bank i have restricted my talk the scope of my presentation would be covering only the immediate environment of the nicu the immediate environment of the nicu which uh, means the environment which is the micro environment for the baby and the environment which is likely to come in contact with the baby which would include certain equipments and certain surfaces in the nicu which need to be cleaned so this presentation or this talk is expected to be a very nodal presentation in the sense that this needs to be uh, uh, joined or addressed to not just nurses to doctors even the housekeeping staff in the nicu need to know what's actually happening in the nicu as far as these practices are concerned the the um, practices the the disinfection practices in the nicu are concerned okay so we with this with this introduction i think we can go on to the next slide yeah so when we talk about disinfection before disinfection there are three three element three elements of hygiene in the nicu the, the first one is cleaning so cleaning what do you mean by cleaning so cleaning actually means the process which will remove any foreign material from any object like you know this is generally given as soil microorganism but if you look at from the nicu perspective okay this would be organic matter something like blood meconium stool urine you know whichever is coming in contact with the baby or in contact with an any equipment or gadget that is in vicinity of the baby so uh, there are certain steps which need to be done to remove these things so by cleaning what you do is you only remove the microbes from the surface and you don't kill those organisms and probably cleaning only clears the or the the uh, the surface or the equipment from the organic matter your certain microorganisms could still be there on the surface so cleaning would be the lowest form of disinfection aspect as far as nicu is concerned so this is best achieved by soap and clean with running water so the equipment or certain uh, so the for example the hand washing that you do and the cleaning of the equipments that you do the first level cleaning that you do with uh, Uh, water and soap and running water running water clean running water it's only the first aspect which is cleaning so all objects that goes without saying all objects in the nicu will definitely require cleaning before you subject them to disinfection before before you disinfect the or, the any surface or any equipment in the nicu that is coming in contact with the baby it has to be clean first of all the macro organism macro organism forget the micro organisms the macro particles or macro organisms should get cleared then only your disinfectant will work your disinf you should not increase the load for your disinfectant to work by having all those macro particles on your surface so first step is cleaning which you achieve in most cases by soap and clean running water next next slide please so the next step is disinfection now comes the most important so disinfection is a process that reduces the number of pathogenic microorganisms huh? this is a very important thing for you to know so it only removes it removes the pathogenic microorganisms from the hands from the surface from the equipment or a, from any inanimate object or skin skin means from the hand to a level that it is not harmful to health so an the easy example for that is your hand hand 
disinfection with an hand drop with an alcohol based hand drop so it only by applying hand drop to your hand the alcohol based hand drop it only takes out the pathogenic microorganisms from your hand to a certain extent your hand could still have certain commensal organisms or certain organisms certain spores which may not be that very harmful to that bee so that is what a disinfection does so all objects must be cleaned before must be cleaned before disinfecting this is something which we covered and this will be required disinfection will be required for any object that will come in contact with the baby it could be the warmer it could be any equipment which you know we'll be seeing the list of equipment subsequently and the linen the cotton the gauze the baby wraps the baby belongings whatever is going to touch the baby's bed or the baby directly okay so disinfection can be done by so many ways moist heat by a temperature or it could be an autoclave it could be a hot air oven or other use of other chemicals so the most commonly used chemical disinfectant in the nicu is 2% glutaraldehyde though the other uh, things which you have put are also important but the most important is going to be the 2% glutaraldehyde so the next one so what we are talking in disinfection also you have different levels low level intermediate and high level disinfection okay so the low level disinfection which we generally don't talk about here in the nicu because this is achieved by some um, disinfectant such as quaternary ammonium compounds you know these may sound very uh, high five for you but to say very simply something like detol or savlon or something like that so uh, using those disinfectants they are low level disinfectants now when you talk about intermediate or high level disinfection this is what needs to be applied in the nic intermediate or high level disinfection for the surfaces and the equipments okay so what does this intermediate and high level disinfection actually do is it goes one step beyond beyond the low level disinfectant in even clearing the spores and other microorganisms from the surface the organisms which are resistant to clean also like for example mycobacterium enteroviruses spores also get cleared by this intermediate or high level disinfection now how does it differ intermediate and high level disinfection for example if you are using uh, glutaral dehyde for disinfection of a particular say amdu bag for a particular equipment so it depends on the contact time so if your contact time or the if your bag and ambu bag is placed in the drum with 2% glutaral dehyde for say 30 to 60 minutes it becomes an intermediate level of disinfection for example if your contact time or your immersion time of this uh, glutra of this ambu bag in glutaral dehyde extends more than 1 hour say 2 to 6 hour 2 to 2 hours or 2 to 6 hours there you call it as high level disinfection so you need to remember that this is not sterilization sterilization you can never achieve high level disinfection is like a proxy to sterilization somewhere getting close to sterilization but not exactly sterilization okay so the next slide please so it is only the contact time which matters okay so the other as uh, things would be disinfectants uh, sterilization is actually what means the, the process which destroys all microorganisms including bacterial spores okay so for that it, uh, you can achieve it by autoclaving by ethylene oxide gas sterilization of all your tubings for an, a period of 4 hours along with aeration and then by a hot air oven hot air oven we commonly use in our nicu nicu milk bank for sterilizing the steel containers that we use for dispensing milk to babies and also by glutaral dehyde 2% glutaral dehyde if you allow the contact time for that equipment for more than 2 hours basically so 2 to 6 hours or something like that you will for more than 6 hours if you achieve that will be uh, sterilization but generally we don't use the, uh, an extended contact time for glutaral dehyde more than 6 hours that is because it can damage it can damage the equipment it can damage the surface so we what we commonly use for chemical disinfection of equipments or, or equipments would be for a contact time of say 2 hours and that will lead to high level disinfection not sterilization so that should be enough going to the next so what i am covering initially is the basics 
you know because i am sure that some of the nurses that were attending the workshop are might be at the in charge level you know so they need to understand first of all why we are using it we will be discussing simultaneously like you know what policies we have for each and every equipment each and every surface but before that why we are using this why why do we need to use that is what they need to understand okay so be, so now comes the classification of critical items and non critical items so what are you have three items one is critical semi critical and non critical items in the nicu so you need to know this before you actually choose okay for this item this disinfectant only we have to use okay so the critical items i have not put critical items here because we very less commonly use critical items here if you want to know examples of critical items any item that goes inside the baby's blood is critical item okay for example if you take adults you you adults an implant a valve implant or a cardiac implant is a critical item it goes inside the blood of the and stays inside the blood or a cavity of the patient in newborns example would be a lion an umbilical lion or a peripherally inserted central catheter a picc basically so these are examples of critical items now critical items we in nic we don't reuse we insert once we take care of it we throw it away so there's no reuse so we don't disinfect them again and again okay so that's why i have not put it in this talk okay if i were if i was covering something like central line practices then i would be including them but not so next level thing is semi critical items so what are semi critical items for us those items that will come in contact with the mucous membrane or with the skin that is damaged okay so this would be something like if you can imagine whatever comes in contact with the mucous membrane is something like laryngoscope or the endotracheal tube respiratory and anesthetic equipment so these are certain things that will come into contact with the respiratory membrane mucous membrane or to skin that is partly abraded or damaged so we need to have high level disinfection for this kind of equipments or this kind of items so a 2% alkaline glutaraldehyde is what would be required for that to disinfect these things so we know what is high level disinfection now and what we use for high level disinfection now you get the reasoning or the understanding as to why this particular item needs high level disinfection because you know that it is going to touch the mucous membrane next slide now these are non critical items so non critical items are what the ones which can which will come in contact with skin intact skin but not with mucous membrane or not with damaged skin also for example your pulse oximeter probes your thermometers your stethoscope your uh, you know your other certain other equipments or certain other lines that come in contact with the skin so these need you know intermediate level or low level disinfection for example you know, they may you know for uh, for example these items like pulse ox probes blood pressure cuffs can be cleaned even with alcohol based disinfectant an alcohol based disinfectant is a very fast acting disinfectant and quick acting it will act immediately after you wipe that um, surface with alcohol but the action won't last long the action would be probably for say 2 minutes or 3 minutes or something like that you don't have an extended disinfectant action on the surface with an alcohol so that you can use for certain these non critical items which do not touch any mucous membrane or come in contact with the uh, abraded you know injured damaged skin next slide yes so when you talk about chemical disinfection in the nicu there are only two or three disinfectants which you commonly use and you use it in different percentages you use it in different dilutions sorry yeah so the commonly used the disinfectant where you use for equipment disinfection for equipment disinfection if you are going to use a chemical disinfectant one a good example one good uh, disinfectant would be corsolex now this is something which needs to be known at every level the doctor the nurses the housekeeping practice everybody now if you go to the west if you are not in india if you go to the west uh chemical disinfectants they don't use it for equipment you know if they drop if somebody drops an ambu forget using it in some baby even if accidentally if somebody drops an ambu bag it goes to the dustbin it does not go for cleaning disinfection or anything like that but uh, staying in india 
and most of you i know would be working in resource limited settings municipal hospitals government hospitals you cannot afford to do that so chemical disinfectants is the way to go for such things so what is this corsolex so this is 2% glutaraldehyde and why it is alkaline previously say some 10 years before they used to have this corsolex which comes in a 10 liter can they used to have it in an acidic form it will be like an acidic liquid why because if you keep it in the shelf for 4 months 5 months it will remain same it won't lose its uh, uh, vitality if it is in the acid form so they will have another alkali or a sodium bicarbonate powder along with that to mix it with that which means once it becomes alkaline only it becomes effective so in an acid form it is stable it will have a good shelf life it will stay in the shelf for 6 months one year whatever it is but when you prepare it and when you put an um, when you put a equipment into that and you want to get it disinfected it has to be alkaline it has to be alkaline so that it has the disinfectant efficacy so active antimicrobial activity will be there only at alkaline ph so that is why the but nowadays when you have nowadays the chemical disinfectants they have inbuilt activator in them so once you prepare you automatically get it as alkaline you don't have to add anything to it so this alkali what is does the bicarbonate in the corsolex it actually penetrates the cell the bacterial cell and helps the glutaraldehyde and destroy that bacterium by penetrating the cell so it will disinfect in 10 minutes and sterilize in 10 hours as i told you it only depends how much time you are keeping that uh, ambu bag in that liquid in that uh, solution which decides how long you are going, what kind of disinfection you are getting if you do it for 10 minutes it is only intermediate level disinfection if you do for 2 hours it is high level disinfection if you do it for 6 hours or more then it is sterilization but that is not what we generally do with this okay so it has got a broad antimicrobial activity and it acts on the spores also it has residual activity also residual activity is something means it's something which extends extends beyond a period of 1 hour 2 hours the the antimicrobial activity on the surface extends for a period next so this is what we use for equipment disinfection now when you talk about surface what do you clean the ventilator surface what do you clean the monitor surface what do you clean the phototherapy equipment what do you clean the warmers with so that is this bacillosis this is just an example so why you use this in particular this also has got 2% glutaraldehyde as you can see in the presentation this has got the disinfectant in that but this glutaraldehyde needs something else also to attach to that surface that will be these ben benzalkonium chloride the other compounds which are there in the disinfectant now why am, am i talking about all this tomorrow if you as a nurse you are going to order disinfectant for your unit you need to see that the surface disinfectant that you are going to order has this glutaraldehyde in it has some form of bound formaldehyde which is there and also has this benzalkonium chloride or a compound which is got surface active property which means this compound will help that glutaraldehyde to stick on to that surface whatever surface it is if it is a warmer if it is a ventilator if it is a phototherapy unit it should help the glutaraldehyde to stick on to that or attach to that surface to bring that disinfectant efficacy okay so you need to see that these these this is a surface disinfectant that you are going to order for that unit so it has to have 2% glutaraldehyde in it in addition to that these compounds next next please yeah so now going into more practical aspect now what what do you what do you actually do with equipments in the nicu so this is these are taken out directly from our unit protocols surya hosp surya nicu uh, protocols which we prepared as a unit so when you first about the equipments what all equipments you will be using for this uh, what are the equipments in which you would be using Uh, uh these disinfectants so if you look at equipment disinfection most important thing the self inflating bag so if you have to disinfect this this has to be put in a drum with corsolex so a corsolex prepared drum which is a 2% glutaraldehyde and the contact time or the duration that you would leave the self inflating bag inside would be 30 minutes and 6 hours if you have used that ambu bag in a baby that is heavily infected or in a baby that has died okay and 
what do you do if you have not used the self inflating bag at all suppose you have disinfected it you have not used it at all for 72 hours then you again need to disinfect it so self inflating bag and face mask most important thing is the self inflating bag has to be dismantled you should not be putting the assembled self inflating bag one reason is it will not clean all the corners and crevices in that bag and the other thing is it will mostly float it won't immerse it won't submerge in the corsolex solution itself you need a disinfectant to you need all your equipments all your this thing to submerge nicely in that disinfectant liquid before it gets disinfected okay so that is number one if you look at the second point face mask self inflating bag cpap masks this is all in relation to nic1 so common things now face masks and cpap masks are are costly you know especially the cpap masks or cpap prongs that we use so we cannot just use it for one time and throw it even in a setup like surya where it's a completely private setup we cannot afford to throw it after single use so we again use that uh, you, you we dip that in the corsolex solution for 30 minutes after every use for after 24 hours and if 70 if you have not used after 72 hours okay the other ones the oxygen tubing oxygen hood and nasal prongs i have put in broad bracket because nowadays we are not disinfecting it. at surya we are discarding it after use say after 24 hours of use or 48 hours of use in a child we are discarding it we are not reusing it but if you choose to reuse in your unit the same policy you will have to follow corselex for 30 minutes and every 72 hours even if you have not used opened but not used okay third aspect is a suction bottle this is commonly used in every ventilated base so a suction bottle how do you disinfect so you open the suction bottle again put it in corselex for 2 hours or for 6 hours if that baby was infected or dead, if if you if the child had died how what do you do about the suction tubing so the suction bottle you immerse it in that corselex but the suction tubing you discard it and every time after suction we use a 100 ml solution of basilosid 0.5% basilosid to flush that so you might be using normal saline but we in our unit have started using that 100 ml of 0.5% basilosid flush after every suction that we do in a baby mostly endotracheal suction and even even after oral suction we do that if we have not used the suction tubing at all for that day for that baby say it's a non ventilated baby and a non cpap baby we may not need suction even in that case in that case we discard the suction tubing we discard the suction tubing after 24 hours okay the other aspect which needs to be cleaned is the other thing which needs to be cleaned is the mr humidifier this is again a very common uh, uh, equipment that gets used in the nicu for any baby on ventilator or cpap support the humidifier not the top one the top one of course you send it for autoclaving or you send it for gas sterilization along with your tubings but this mr rate to the base the humidifier base you still need to clean it with 0.5% basilosid every 72 hours so the basic if you see my presentation the basically there are two um, the disinfectants that we use one is the corsolex which is an equipment disinfection you prepare it in a drum and you uh, dip all you immerse all the equipments in it the other is the 0.5% basilosid which we use for cleaning the surfaces surfaces so one surface is the mr850 humidifiers base okay now the laryngoscope as you know the laryngoscope becomes a semi critical item because it touches the mucous membrane you know it's a respiratory equipment so yes corsolex we dip it in corsolex for 30 minutes after use after of course you need to be very mindful that you detach the bulb and the batteries because the bulb uh, the alcohol uh, aldehyde in the corsolex can be damaging to the bulb and the batteries also you should take out because it can react with it and after taking it out of corselex after 30 minutes you have to run you wash it with running sterile water prior to use it in the baby okay so this laryngoscopic clean laryngoscope cleaning needs to be done after every use of the laryngoscope and even if you have not used it every 24 hours you need to do that and after cleaning it with water before every use in the baby you need to clean the blade with an alcohol swab next slide sorry uh, i think you've skipped the next one you need to go i mean you, you've gone too far even before that before that sorry yes so um, uh, 
this is surface one before that the one before that sorry yes transport equipment yes you have a transport bag which has got all these equipments bamboo mask scope neopuff tubing yes neopuff tubing and the oxygen tubing all you will follow the same policy that you would do for a mask and a self inflating bag now you will have procedure drum cotton gauze and all in the nicu procedure drum for an umbilical line you will have it for uh, you you have a procedure for csf so csf analysis so many things so that drum will come autoclave to you and it needs to be done twice daily baby bed covers drapes and rolls we wash it and autoclave now for autoclave the 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 drapes have to be reasonably thick huh? the furry mattresses or the for the soft mattresses or the soft um, drapes that you use for some babies which has got some fur element you will not be able to autoclave this so you will only wash and use it but the ones the completely cotton thick bed covers and drapes you will be able to autoclave and use it it has to be done once daily okay suppose you are not using that drape on that particular day next day it will again have to go for washing because you cannot use it for the next day even if you have not used it. injection tray the injection tray that you keep it at the bedside i am aware that some centers would have a, a tray where which you will use for iv line insertion you will you will have your things in that and that kind of thing so that also needs to be autoclaved once a day okay the other aspects the other things the stethoscope weighing machine pulse ox probes these are our non critical items which we already discussed so that if you are able to clean with basilol which is an alcohol based disinfectant that should be enough as i said fast fast uh, fast acting short duration lasting that's okay for these non critical items same for thermometer and measuring tape even you know alcohol swab cleaning before use should suffice next next please yeah i'm sorry <sighs> sorry the uh, can you go back to the previous one the surface surface no, talking about surfaces surfaces you look at the floors sinks laminar floor surface all will be cleaned with 0.5% bacillosid and this has to be done three times a day the laminar floor surface has to be cleaned with 0.5% bacillosid three times a day next the walls doors shelves in the nicu Uh, medication staff doctors workstation nurses workstation x-ray machine bedside equipment drug tray not uh, drug tray means not the tray which is used inside the laminar floor you would have a drug tray below the baby's warmer or the trolley where you have certain drugs in you have certain um, injections or um, uh, medications in the sealed form you take out when you need it for you you know you you use that so it's it's still a non critical item that also has to be cleaned with bacillosid once a day the refrigerator where you store all your samples blood milk whatever it is soap and water daily radiant warmer and incubator yes as far as the radiant warmer and incubator the surface would be cleaned with 0.5% bacillosid daily and 2% only once weekly 2% can be very strong so you would do it only once weekly particular in incubator after the baby is discharged from the incubator taken out of the incubator or you know if any baby in the incubator has died and you know you want to use it for another child yes before that you need to do it and whenever you have taken a baby a baby stays in the incubator for a few weeks say 5 weeks 6 weeks and after that it is out before you use it for the next baby when it is not in use disinfect it uh, disinfect it with 2% bacillosid phototherapy unit ventilator cpap high flow nasal cannula machine the the machine and the mr850 humidifier base all will be cleaned with 0.5% bacillosid uh store room shelves everything like that sharps container of course sharps will be you know you don't use any disinfectant in that anymore so you discard them once the container is 3/4 full next okay so if you if you have a look this is just the policy this is the policy that we uh, have in a, we have a written policy as far as sterilization disinfection of our nicu is concerned so these are certain things which will come in handy you can just have a look there are certain things in when you the certain principles which you need to know while you are uh, disinfecting a self inflating bag one most important thing is first you know you have to dismantle the bag completely you have to, you have to take out the valves everything separately and then clean it wash it in with soap solution soap uh, solution and running water first before you put it in any disinfectant okay and the bag should be completely immersed in the disinfectant the uh, corsolex drum which has been prepared so it has to be disinfected before doing that you need to air dry that before you put any uh, disinfection and this uh, any 
um, a part of the ambu bag into the disinfectant, you have to air dry it. Air dry, every word is important here, right? You know, you have to dry it, not just blow, should not blow dry it. You have to air dry it, which means you have to give enough time. You have to keep it in an aerated place and allow it to dry on its own. Why is it required? Because if, if you have water content in that, if you put it into your disinfectant, your 2% glutaraldehyde will become 1.5% or 1.25% glutaraldehyde. That is no longer a disinfectant at all. So your 2% glutaraldehyde work only as long as it is 2%. So it is very important to note that all your equipments are dry before they are put in the, it has to be washed, it has to be dried before you put it into the drum. Next, if you see, uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, so disinfectant time we have already discussed. No, no, no. Please don't skip through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you are using the corselex, how you prepare the corselex? So these are there are certain instructions that we give to our housekeeping staff. They need to know that also. Like they need to minimum prepare a disinfectant of ten liters. So if you look at this document at the bottom, you will see. Please don't scroll that. Yeah, sorry. So if you look at the preparation, we have also mentioned the preparation, how you get to 2.5% bacillosid. The bacillosid can or the can which comes, it's a 5% solution. Okay. So to obtain a 0.5% solution, you actually take 50 ml out of that bacillosid and mix it with 10 liters water. That is how you get that solution. Okay. Same for 2% bacillosid. This is how you get it. 200 ml bacillosid in 10 liters of water. Same way for Corselex also, it is like that, you know, you take 200 ml of that and prepare it in 10 liters of water and accordingly get it. So this is something also which you need to see, whatever can you are getting, you need to know what percentage solution is coming in that concentrate. According to that, only you will have to prepare your solution. So this can vary depending upon the particular uh, company that you are getting the disinfectant from, this can vary. So you need to be mindful of the concentration, the percentage of the concentrate, and then accordingly dilute to get the solution that you need. Okay. So if you look at the top one, the corsolex, like the two percent glutaraldehyde. So minimum ten liters you need because I told that all your equipments or the small equipments, oxygen tubing, mask, everything should be completely immersed in that. It has to be submerged. So you need to have a particular level. This would roughly come up to you know three fourths of a normal bucket, a bathroom bucket, no. Apna bathroom ka jo bucket, roughly three fourth of that will get filled. The other thing is the suction, uh, uh, the second point, third point, fourth point. Yes, point E. If you look, you need to use light color buckets because most of these solutions, most of these solutions, because they are alkaline, they have this bicarbonate in them. They are color coded. They would come in different colors. Something in rose, something in light yellow, and all that. The reason for that is if the disinfectant efficacy comes down, this color fades. For example, you prepare a 2% solution or if you get a 2% solution, if it becomes dilute because of all the water that is that on the surface of all the equipments, if the color dims, it becomes light pink instead of dark pink. So that is why you need to use them in transparent buckets. At Surya, if you have, we have transparent buckets into which only we prepare this corselex so that you are able to see the color change. It is very important for you to see the color change. Because you know that your disinfectant is getting diluted and it is no longer a disinfectant. So that is very important. So use light colored buckets or transparent buckets to note the color change. And the, equip the tubings have to be dried and discard the solution if there is a color change or the shelf life which is or the active life, the, the life of the disinfectant which is given by the company. They would say you can use it for 14 days or sometimes 7 days. You will have to follow that. So whichever comes whichever comes earlier the color change or the seven or 14 day mark you need to discard your solution so once you prepare the solution you also label the date that you prepared the solution so this is something which needs to be known by your housekeeping staff and some responsible for person from the doctors uh, from the medical staff has to supervise that these things are happening okay so regarding phototherapy units infusion pumps we have again dis uh, discussed all these things Radiant warmer, of course, you know, uh, uh, these, this, is, this is also something which we have discussed. Floors, walls, shelves, sinks. Yes, sinks again we clean with 
uh, we clean at least three to four times a day with same 0.5 percent basal oxide solution. Next, uh, next please. Yes, the other thing which I missed in that was a surveillance swabs that we sent. Now there is lots of disagreement among people. People say that you know you actually don't need to send surveillance swabs from the NICU. So this is something I would say that you know you need to suit yourself. There is no strong evidence to say that you know surveillance swabs have to be sent mandatorily from a unit. Okay. There is no evidence to support that. You know Western units would generally shun this unless there is an outbreak in your unit. There is no necessity to send routine surveillance swabs. But this policy will depend on your unit's uh, antimicrobial policy, your unit's uh, antimicrobial resistance levels, your unit's rate at which culture positivity comes out. So you need to suit yourself. In our, uh, at here, we, we, there are certain areas in the NICU where we find there is lots of bacterial contamination. From those areas, we send surveillance swabs like uh, the sinks, milk bank, laminar flow. You, we don't have organisms over there, but these are very, certain areas where we are very watchful about. So we do send them once in a month, say on the 10th of, the, 10th of uh, every month, we have fixed it up. So the microbiology team and the infection control team also liaises with us on this particular day. And we send swabs and we check. Even if our surveillance level is good, we don't grow anything. We're happy about it. But we, we, we keep a constant check on this. Okay, so this is something that you need to suit yourself. Then this bacillus, the different preparations that you have, this is not just for the NICU, this is also for the other areas. For example, uh, you operate in certain areas which also has an NICU and an OT and, you know, a, a labor OT and all that. So the dilution will vary accordingly. So if you are going to use the postnatal ward for floor cleaning, you can use 0.5% bacillosid. If you are disinfecting your OT, OT or, uh, you know, a, 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 an area of the NICU, which is an isolation area, a negative, isola negative uh, um, uh, room, room, an isolation area, so these areas probably are more critical areas as far as infection control is concerned. So you can use a 1% dilution of bacillosid for disinfection. 2% we would generally recommend for weekly disinfection of all the critical areas like the OT or something like that. Weekly once, when you know patients are not there in that time, you just disinfect, uh, clean that area with um, the floors with 2% um, bacillosid and leave it. Okay, next. Next please. Yeah, sodium hypochlorite, again, you know, people, those who are not able to afford uh, units, you know, uh, uh, way back in 2007, 2008, while we were doing our DM at KM, we used for wherever we, we were to use bacillosid, we used sodium hypochlorite. So it's an excellent disinfectant. So in low resource settings, you know, except for the order if that, you know, the, that some people may not... Uh, may not get used to or may not be convenient with, yes, but it is an excellent disinfection in low resource settings. Okay, so here also the solution comes as 5% solution for most purposes for the floor disinfection and all, you use only 0.5 to 1% solution. And this is, this is the only way to disinfectant blood spills, which also I have mentioned over there. So you use different strengths of solution for the spill for the spill, depending upon the size of the spill. The diameter of the spill being less than 10 centimeter where it's a small spill and where it's a large spill, it's more than 10 centimeter. So before using the disinfectant, it's important to put uh, an absorbent uh, tissue, an absorbent tissue paper or gauze piece over that area. The disinfectant to that area. Okay, next. Next, please. So these are other certain important principles, which, you know, sometimes are all forgot, sometimes are forgotten. You know, the most important uh, um, immediate environment for the baby is, you know, you are uh, uh, not just your hands, hand hygiene are not covered because it's a big, it's another important area. I won't be able to do justice to that. But, you know, your, uh, your, uh, the areas in your elbow. So it's important that, you know, your socks are rolled up, your sleeves are fully taken out. Uh, you need to use separate stethoscope for each baby, thermometer for each baby. So these are certain things which the nurse should be very particular about to avoid cross-infection. And you should always avoid keeping fomites like, you know, files, x-ray films on the baby cord. 
you know sometimes when nurse is charting the temperature or anything like that you know accidentally mm-hmm. use the pen or the monitoring chart on the baby's bed these are certain things which have to be avoided you know it might sound, look very silly but we keep seeing this day in and day out and these are very important housekeeping measures to contain or to create a safe micro environment for the baby next yes these are other important principles which i am this is the last slide so this is for cleaning your floors basically you know the 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 concept of dry mopping is not there so you know all these bacteria need to be wet mopped means it should be absorbed by your mop and then discarded so you should not follow dry mopping it has to be wet mopping only for the nicu floors and you should use a double bucket technique which you can see in that uh, photo you know you should not just use a single bucket you should have two uh, to, uh, disinfectants filled in two buckets there and the clean water is uh, is where you should first wring your mop in and then clean the floor and then put that rinse that mop in the dirty water area take it out clear all the dirt and then go back to your clean water and then keep discarding that dirty water periodically until you are completely clean that particular area so double bucket technique is what is being recommended for everybody this is something which you know you need to know so that you so that the housekeeping um, staff uh, you can ensure that the housekeeping staff follow it flooding flooding is something which is being conventionally described for now you know this most important question which used to be asked uh, 10 years before is do you need to fumigate your nicu you know the answer nowadays is no the answer at that time was also a big no so a routine fumigation was always a no now when you get an outbreak what do you do do you need to fumigate your nicu again the answer is no so what they do is they they use a different term they call it as high level disinfection so the same glutaraldehyde the 2% glutaraldehyde that i described for equipment disinfection and for surface disinfection right the same thing you use it you the area that you want to disinfect you first close that completely flood that area with all your disinfectant the 2% glutaraldehyde that you have prepared also scrub and clean the at least one third of that wall also in that area and then close that sir close that room and then after 6 hours or something like that open that room so you have given a high level disinfection to that area remember we talked about that contact time of 6 hours then you open that area open that area not for use open the windows and all so that the extra odor and all goes away and then say after 24 hours that room is ready for patient admission or whatever it is or for taking back your babies which you have already isolated to something so flooding was something which was conventionally described at that point so flooding with a or a high level disinfection is what needs to be followed when you have an outbreak and you want to clear your environment in that particular area okay so that completes the uh, presentation on environmental disinfection in the nicu so i hope i covered uh, the most practical aspects of uh, nicu environment disinfection if you have any doubts you can approach me you can you can also you know uh, take your uh, uh, take my email id can visit our nicu and see the policies that we have in place or you can also take the brochures or the policies the written policies that we have in our nicu so that you can follow them without uh, without any issue thank you so much jaisal for uh, uh, giving us this giving me this opportunity yeah i said i will keep it within half an hour but you know i couldn't help it yeah so thank you dr hari uh, this is i think i'm hearing you the same talk four time and every time there is you know lot to learn so now i will request our experts dr rahul yadav sir nay and dr rishikesh thakre to uh, give the comments on the subject and the uh, cne and then we go from there rishikesh sir can you hear me okay rao sir we can hear you yes yes but uh, i can't show the video actually can you ask the organizer to uh, this one uh, uh, start video Uh, yes sir i'll ask the i'll uh, i'll ask them to so that you can share the video just give me a yes. some time okay fine, fine meanwhile this one i would like to uh, uh, request bala uh, to actually prepare videos on this whatever he described in the- theoretically various preparing some solutions and how to clean and all those things 
it is quite difficult to understand for sisters in total they can understand part of it but they won't understand fully so this one i will i will request the speaker to prepare some videos about how to prepare this corsal ex how to prepare bacillus seed how to clean it so so that it will be quite easy to understand to people correct uh yeah so uh, now you can show the video actually you can share your screen yeah 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 no no i don't want to show any video i just want to uh, uh, highlight one part actually missed by both of uh, speakers is hub care hub care hub i mean iv infections this uh, this this sort of uh, line induced infections we can prevent by actually taking care of hub hub is the joint between two parts of this iv line and these are alcohol swabs so this alcohol swab has to be put on this one and we have to rotate clockwise anti clockwise and we have to sterilize this particular joints before and after giving injections and afterwards allow it to air dry and then you have to connect it this hub care should be actually practiced by every every sister so that this line iv line induced infection is our main problem nowadays so this iv line should be maintained without causing any infection second thing i would like to highlight is both the speakers did not give uh, some slides on hand hand hygiene hand hygiene is something which we which we talk too much about it but actually when it comes at night the hand hygiene goes down so the reasons for hand hygiene going down is the smell so after using hand rub and all those in number of times the sisters can't eat properly during eating they get smell so many sisters they actually they avoid hand hygiene properly so after using hand hygiene at this one uh, this one, see to it that before eating before having lunch or dinner in between you if you wash the hand thoroughly with soap water the smell goes off and we can enjoy your meal uh, so so hand hygiene should be actually practiced quite uh, uh, rigorously second second thing i would like to highlight is the amount of hand rub because of this covid epidemic this hand rub has become quite common everywhere so there is uh, actually many times this hand rub is used very cursorily just somebody somebody something puts on hand and that and it moves on so this particular thing should be avoided hand rub use has to be told clearly that when you go to metro station or train or entering some mall at that time you also use hand rub that hand rub use is entirely different from what hand rub use in nsu so this hand hand rub when you are using this particular you should have the palm full of hand rub this should not be too less it should be too more so we have to uh, you have to press it gently twice there should be palm full of hand rub should be there and the same steps what we use for hand washing should be enforced for hand hand rub also only difference is here we should not use force we should use force gently you have to spread it all over the surface when you spread all over surface don't touch the baby immediately we have to touch the baby after some time when it is dried up and this drying is actually known by the nurses after using hand wash if you use hand rub quickly without drying then this hand rub is not effective so hand wash or by adequate drying or by adequate hand rub adequate drying and then only touch the baby so these two things i would like to highlight hand rub use is still uh, initially in covid epidemic hand rub use was quite good infection rate came down but after a few months this hand rub has become like a cursory so we have to ensure that hand rub use is told to every sister by inch as sister properly these two things only i want to highlight hub care and hand rub thank you uh, thank you so much uh, rao sir such a practical useful tips uh, rishi sir your expert comments thank you dr shilpa dr hari uh, very practical talks and uh, well uh, as far as uh, <clears throat> neonatal sepsis is concerned there is only one simple mantra that you should keep in mind as far as assessment and uh, management is concerned and that mantra is tops mantra t o p s if you are able to assess temperature oxygen perfusion and sugar for every sick newborn and be able to assess support and maintain temperature oxygen perfusion and sugar this will make your things much streamlined more objective and will give rise to better outcomes as far as man the management principles of neonatal sepsis is concerned well there was one question i think dr uh, hari uh, could take that do you suggest uh, 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 flushing of the suction catheters 
flushing of the suction catheters we after, you mean after the uh, after the endotracheal suction or the oral suction yeah, i can yeah. perform yeah 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 uh well that's a good question there is so far no evidence to say that uh, you know it really it, it's a harmful uh, it, whether it should not be attempted or anything like that so it is basically uh, uh for uh, practice in units where uh, a child has got lots of secretions in which and you know you may not be able to change the suction uh, tubing every time every time that you do a suction the ideal way would be to change the entire system after you have done a suction of a respiratory secretion that would be the ideal thing but if you are not able to achieve that in certain units even in the best of the settings in private uh, setups in the country may not be able to achieve that in which case we use that flushing with a disinfectant a 0.5% surface disinfectant say 100 ml or something like that to disinfect that particular surface and wash it and if we this this if we do it for 24 hours after that we discard it again this is not an evidence based policy this is something which we practice in our unit so again you know there are different units which may practice it differently but uh, yeah it is not very evidence based at the moment and hari last comment on uh, use of breast milk as a uh... a disinfectant as an antiseptic in the nursery yes in fact uh, that is one that is one area which i have not covered in fact while i started the presentation itself i made a disclaimer that uh, you know the to the topic for today would be environmental disinfection the original presentation actually was included right from hand hygiene aseptic non touch technique the central line care the ventilator care of other areas but you know because of the uh, time duration the time restraints we couldn't include all that most important is breast milk is definitely is the most important the most harmless medicine or elixir that can be given to the child so of course besides the red- reduction in the rate of infections evidence has shown that not just infection name anything mortality Uh, rop bpd hospitalization rate oxygenation use everything has significantly reduced in a baby that is on breast milk uh, support and uh, preferably own mother's milk so if you are able to uh, achieve uh, a completely 100% breast milk uh, uh, you know uh, based unit at least for babies who are born less than 32 weeks and 1.5 kilos it has it plays a major role in improving the reducing the rate of infection as as it is we know that there are only two interventions which will work at a mass level in reducing the incidence rate of incident, infection one is hand hygiene and the second is going to be breast breast milk breast feeding so there's no doubt about that so if you are there are certain steps that one needs to take for that of course you know donor milk banking is one important step to that oropharyngeal colostrum if you are able to achieve also of course the evidence is not very uh, you know uh, it, it is two sided basically but still there's no harm by giving that you know if it suits your unit and if it's able to bring down the rates of ventilator associated infections or the other um, respiratory tract infections in your unit it's worthwhile yes I think I thank uh, everyone. I thank uh, Dr. Hathi, Dr. Deepa, Dr. Rahul Yadav, uh, Dr. Rishikesh sir uh, for being here. Thank you everyone who has attended this talk. We are going to do it on uh, you know every month. So I'll send. I'll keep posting you. And I also thank the whole uh, Maharashtra NNF uh, committee. to actually empower us to start this kind of the online program so thank you everyone uh, you can many of you have the numbers of some of us you can message you in the comments thank you thank you